If you care to follow along, please open your pew Bibles to Luke. We're going to start in chapter 11 uh, with the parable that starts in verse 5, and then we're going to jump over to uh, verse 18. And I've given my eyesight and the, my preference for the NIV. I'm going to read it from the NIV, but if uh, the words are slightly different, this is Luke 11, 5 to 8. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. And then turning to Luke 18, verses 1 to 9. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because his widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank Thanks be to God. I try to get out from behind the pulpit, especially when I don't have the PowerPoint projector to make me a somewhat more interesting than uh, just a talking head. So I'm going to make it hard on Paul and, and Quinn here to keep up with me on the audio and video, but hey, that's what they don't get paid for. <laughs> Would you please pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Corey Ten Boom, a great Christian, had this to say about prayer. Is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Is it your first resort or your last? Well, when all else fails, may as well pray, you know, <laughs> nothing else left. Sometimes we, we pray only when we feel the need. You know, it reminds me of a pretend Sunday school story with little Johnny, who's apparently the perennial Sunday school student, being faced with the question by the teacher, now, Johnny, tell me frankly, in your house before dinner, do you pray? And Johnny answered quickly, no, we don't need to pray. My mom's a good cook. So, <laughs> today, we're going to explore those dynamics and the meaning of the parables from the Gospel of Luke, as well as the, the uh, offertory that God sent is going to offer and the great hymns that we got from the choir, because they're, they've already started my sermon for me. We're going to explore the meaning of what does it mean to listen to these themes and examine why is it that God wants us to be persistent in prayer? Why doesn't he just answer us immediately or give us the answer when we want it? How do we deal with the feelings of frustration and disappointment when it seems that there is no answer to our prayers? How do we come to grips with the fact that no and not yet are also answers, even though they may not be the ones we want to hear. How do we listen for God in the silence and be aware of those answers that we may not be expect to be hearing? And above all, how can we learn to focus our prayers by putting God's will ahead of our own? Because sometimes that's what it takes to urge that answer forward. So we have the parable of the persistent friend, or in more Latin terms, the importunate neighbor. Importunate rhymes with unfortunate, but what does it mean? It means persistent, especially to the point of being annoying or intrusive, urgently persistent in solicitation. 
So anybody who's emailed me expecting a response knows that generally you've got to be importunate because it'll take a couple of tries perhaps with all the hundreds of emails I get for me to act. We know that it's just sort of a, a, a fact of life that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And we see that adage in both parables of the lazy neighbor and the unjust judge. But was Christ really intending to compare our heavenly father to a lazy neighbor or an unjust judge? Is that what he was saying? You've got to bother God because he really doesn't care, but eventually he'll just get around to it because it's better than hearing from you all the time? No, in, in thinking about it, I think the answer is that the persistence that God seeks from us in prayer isn't for his benefit, it's for ours. It isn't for his motivation, it's for ours. In the surrounding scriptures that's, that, that attend these parables, Jesus says that even if a flawed human being, an imperfect person with selfish motives or procrastination, is willing to respond to persistent pleas, then how much more will our loving Father, who has only our best interests at heart, want to do for us? So if God is love and he stands ready to take care of his people and to answer our prayers, why make us ask repeatedly? Why does he even dare to say no sometimes? Well, you know, that's, that's hard, and, and here's something that I think we have to come to grips with. God isn't Santa Claus. He isn't a genie in a bottle, and he isn't Amazon.com. You know, this, this Christmas, it was great, because um, I have family members who have come to the realization that making somebody go out and buy them something in hopes that you've thrown the dart in the right spot on the board and found what they want isn't necessarily the best way to spend money or or share your generosity. So there's this technology on Amazon where you can make your own little wish list of things you really want and then you click a button and it's sent out to the world and everybody can see what it is they want to buy for you. Kind of like a wedding registry but for everyday gifts. And I came to realize that sort of in my prayer life I'm sort of sending that wish list out to God and expecting him to, to hit my Amazon.com wish list there. And I've, I've given him two or three choices. So, you know, if they don't have the Beats pill in white with the gold trim, I can get it in, you know, in black. That'll be okay. <laughs> God doesn't exist to satisfy our will. We exist as a reflection of his will. And this is a the theme that's uncomfortable for many of us. It bothers some of us. I, I, I get it when people say, oh, you know, or, you know, for those who are friends, uh, fans of the Monty Python British comedy troupe, you know, God, we're always groveling in front of God. God just wants us to grovel, and he has to reinforce how he's mighty and we're low, and even in the affirmations of, of faith or in the prayer of confession, we're always putting ourselves down here and talking about how rotten we are and how lowly we are, and we can't look, you got to avert our eyes, and da-da-da-da-da. And it bothers some of us, but it's not about groveling. It's about humility, and it's about realizing who we're talking to. When we pray, and as Protestants, we enjoy the tradition that we can pray directly to God without an intermediary, we're praying to the creator of the universe, to the master of our existence, to the very essence, the alpha, the omega, of not only our beings and our lives, but of all time. So if we state demands to God on, in, in the sense that it's our time or when we can finally get around to talking to God or that we have a list of things we want and expect to have happen and we do that as though we're peers or God forbid even above God, how honestly can we expect him to helpfully intervene for our situation? And as I'm thinking about perseverance, I'm remembering that part of Romans 5 that talks about since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is really hard, this next part. We also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope never shames us. So persistence in prayer is perhaps part of this exercise of building our character of helping us develop hope and faith. Because that hope, that belief in the promise of something unseen but good, even though we don't know exactly how it's gonna turn out, is the very bedrock of our Christian faith. 
So just as we had the wrap up to the prayer and seek ye first, that's how Christ concludes the parable, the first of the two parables we read about the homeowner coming down and giving the bread to his friend just to stop the knocking. And Christ says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be open. So if God has made this promise, why hasn't my prayer been answered? Well, there's, there's a, a really old Clark Gable movie called Teacher's Pet, and it, it uh, involves a journalist. And in there, there's a, a brief moment of what is a good news story or a good journalist cover. The who, what, where, when, and how of the story. So I find sometimes when I'm struggling with a problem, I like to look at the, the what, where, when, and why, or the who, what, when, and how. And so I'm gonna do that here in this context. I think the first thing we really need to ask ourselves is, is it really true we haven't received an answer? Did we miss hearing the answer because it's not the one we expected? Was it not yet or no? And if the answer isn't the one we wanted, why? What are we praying for? You know, maybe we're not praying for the right thing or not praying for it at the right time. Throughout many wars and armed conflicts, devout Christians on both sides have prayed for exactly opposite results. God is a just God and he's a logical God. How can he grant the prayers of a devout Lutheran in Germany in World War II for Germany to prevail while at the same time grounding the prayers of a devout Presbyterian in America that America prevail in the war? And I don't think God was picking sides, whether it's a Super Bowl team, or, you know, praying for opposite results or whatever. God's will has to be paramount to our own plans. And so perhaps the way we're phrasing our prayer is more designed to satisfy an or need the way we see it, as opposed to from the broader perspective of how God sees things. Is what we're asking for really the proper subject of prayer? Here's one of my flaws. I leave late for an appointment, and then I pray frantically that there's no traffic and I get green lights all the way. <laughs> who would want to get on board with a plane with a pilot who was like, oh God, you know, I, didn't, I had a great weekend, I didn't get around to doing that pre-flight inspection on the plane, I may not have put enough fuel in, but oh well, God's my co-pilot, right? I'll just pray I get there. Or the New York Giants famously praying on the Super Bowl 25 sidelines for the Buffalo Bills kicker to miss a potentially game-winning field goal. Is that really what God wants us to be praying for? Is that really what the master of the universe is going to take time out for, put the other calls on hold, and say, yeah, you know what, I don't want Norwood making that kick. Are we seeking the easy way out, the path of least resistance in our prayers? I know that's my favorite path. Um, a close friend sent me this week an email reflection talking about this very subject of do we pray to skirt adversity and get around the challenges when often God's will for us is really to go through them. And that's easy for me to stand up in here and say, I'm not facing a degenerative disease. I'm not facing cancer. I'm not dealing with those things. Yeah, I got stresses in my life. I got finances. I'm raising kids. I've got, you know, work and all this other stuff. But it's really nice to stand up here and give you platitudes about how great this stuff is and, and whatever. But there's people who going through is really terrible. They would much rather go around than through that kind of problem. And, and we need to recognize that, I think as that author of that devotional posted, we need to understand that God has that plan for through. And even though we don't know why, whatever it is he has on the other side is what's best for us. And, and we don't know why, and we won't know why in this lifetime. And really that comes down to that core decision of faith that we make every day as Christians. Are we gonna believe, even though the world can mock us, even though there's a lot of of ways that you can ridicule the faith or say, oh yeah, oh that plane crash killing all those kids or that school shooting, that's really nice handiwork there, God. Didn't see you answering that prayer, but suddenly I get something good happen to me and I'm gonna give you all the praise. Well, you know what? That's part of the, the difficulty of Christianity. That's part of exercising our faith is knowing that God is in control and he does have the answers even when we don't like them and can't understand them now. If God were Santa Claus and if he just simply granted our prayers as we asked for them, if prayer were simply a matter of making a wish list, what would we learn of faith? Wouldn't we likely view ourselves as the source of the power? We make a wish, it turns into reality. 
we become the center of the universe, not God. So in this litany of asking myself why the prayers aren't being answered, where am I praying? You know, am I praying in the right format and context? And am I praying in the right place? God, Jesus talks about going into a closet and praying, not praying for the sake of being seen. Now, I know, you know, Madonna puts on a great show, and she has her little huddle ahead of time, and Tim Tebow has made a lot of controversy for taking the knee at the football field and all that stuff, and maybe there's a place for that kind of prayer. But when we're talking about the kind of contemplative prayer, the kind of prayer that we need to get through a life-changing adversity or make an important decision, do we take a pay cut or move for a better job on the chance it'll come out better? Do we leave an abusive spouse, even though it means disruption for our children? Do we opt for medical care that's palliative, or do we try to continue to seek a cure? Um, that kind of prayer, uh, you know, you try different places. You try it alone in solitude, like on the night of his arrest when Christ went and left his disciples for a few minutes and prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Or we pray in groups here in, in the church or in a sanctified place. I know when things have been really bothering me, sometimes I've found a niche in a cemetery that's really peaceful or in a park, some place where I feel connected to God, whether it's a church cathedral or a mountain cathedral, to put aside all the other thoughts and really spend a moment addressing our concerns to the master of the universe. When do we talk to God? I mean, I know my mom always says every time I call her, you never call. I'm calling now, mom. <laughs> you never call. <laughs> Um, I have certain friends and relatives, I think we all do, who call only when they need something. Are we that way with God? Are we calling only when we're in trouble or we're calling only when we need something because of a crisis as opposed to calling and just saying thank you? I think sometimes getting through those hard parts, focusing on what we are grateful for while we're waiting for the bigger answers, thanking for the little ones can help grant us perseverance and patience. You know, it's ironic that we live in an era of modern instant messaging and we can get information more quickly and readily than we ever could before, and yet it seems we've grown more impatient as a result. We think, oh, well, look at those lucky people who lived a couple thousand years ago. God would appear to them. You know, he's burning bushes and he's, you know, shouting people's names three times in rooms and he's leading them out of Egypt and doing all this great stuff and Christ is walking around healing the blind and the sick and the lame, and they all got to see that and we don't. Well, remember, too, how few, a relatively handful of people got to see that. And I don't know about you, but I really wouldn't want to trade place with the Jewish slaves in, in Egypt just for the benefit of getting a chance to see that burning bush or those testamentary tablets come down. But think about also, people, most people couldn't read back then. There was no way of communicating God's word. Now we have technology and literacy rates where anybody who really wants to in this country find the word of God can easily do it, can easily worship. God is here. He's no less present. He's no more absent than before. But we have means of accessing him that our forebearers did not. Are we ready for what we've asked for? Is now the right time? You know, I think there's an old adage, be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. Um, parents can relate to telling their kids no or not now, not because we want to deprive them of something that's helpful or beneficial to them, but because we know what's best for them, and we know it's not yet the right time. I mean, handing a new driver the keys to the Porsche sports car would probably answer every young driver's fervent prayer, but, but we know that would end possibly in tragedy and would not be what's best for them. And that brings us back again to the fact God tells us he wants to have faith like a child, but none of us want to be treated like children. We don't like the fact that God is our father, and he gets to say no or not now, or not yet, because we are his children. Persisting in prayer and critically self-examining ourselves in the face of a no answer or no answer is important for humility and for subjecting ourselves and writing that relationship, that understanding of how does God's mercy flow and who earned it, us or Christ? Is it a gift or an entitlement? The passage from Luke 18 concludes with Jesus asking the question, upon his return, will he find faith on earth? This suggests that to me that unanswered prayers or delay in answering prayer may be meant to strengthen our faith and that despite our frustration, doubts, and disappointments, persisting in prayer is a way of us showing that faith back to God to say, we understand, I don't have the answer I'm looking for yet, God, but I'm not quitting. It's not a one-time call. Prayer is cathartic. 
It's a way, even, even if we don't get the answer right now, it's a way of cleansing and purging ourselves. It's a way of just going on a rant. Not that we're ranting at God, but I know, you know, I know, I know folks who feel better after they go on a rant. I'm certainly probably one of them. There's a certain value to getting these things off our chest, even if we can't deal with them right now. And prayer is formative and inspirational. You know, we pray from our own perspective, and the, the biblical account of David and Goliath doesn't necessarily mention prayer, but I think we can probably intuit the prayers of the characters involved by their actions. So you have King Saul, and he wants David to be victorious over the Philistine giant Goliath. But Saul's approach was to give David a heavy helmet, armor, and a huge heavy sword. His vision of victory was to thrust out with a heavy sword to kill a giant. So that may have been his prayer or his image of victory that he would pray for. But David couldn't labor under the weight of that sword. That wasn't who he was. And more importantly, that's not how God wanted that victory to come down. Because if it had come down that way, it would have just been another military battle or perhaps one for the underdog. But the manner of victory would have risked taking the focus away from God's true message and his divine power by allotting the credit to Saul or his swordsmith or David's swordsmanship. We know that Paul, the apostle, prayed three times for a thorn to be removed from his flesh. He had some terrible affliction. We don't know what it was, but it bothered him enough that he repeatedly prayed for it. And it was never removed. When that prayer went unanswered, he took it on faith that there was some higher purpose for him to live with this affliction. He viewed it as perhaps keeping him humble. He didn't like it. He continued to pray, but over time that prayer evolved from one of God remove the affliction to God make me strong in my weakness. He focused us that God's grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so Christ's power may rest on me. Even in addition to the Lord's Prayer, which probably should be probably more called the Disciples' Prayer, Christ gave another example of how to pray when he was in the garden. On the night of his arrest, he fell face to the ground alone and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Putting God's will paramount to our own. So if we ponder the words of the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, they're amazing in and of themselves. But Joseph Scriven, who wrote them as a poem in the 1850s, had an amazing story. He was living in Ireland, he fell in love, and the day before he was to be married, he met his wife, streamside on a horseback ride. She arrived first. The horse threw her. She fell and hit her head and drowned in the stream. He arrived as her dead body was being pulled from the water. In the face of that horrible adversity, he decided to get as far away as he could, and he moved to Canada, and he became a great saint among people doing all kinds of good Samaritan-type deeds. He became a tutor and eventually met uh, the daughter of one of his patrons, a pupil, and he fell in love, and they were engaged to be married. And again, shortly before that wedding, she died. He never married again, and as his, or tried to marry again. And as his mother lay dying in Ireland, and he had neither the means nor ability to get to her, he wrote in poem form the hymn that we have today is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. He focuses, even through all that grief and sorrow, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And then he focuses, much as the commandments do, we have the positive commandments, we shall worship the Lord our God before others, and then we have the negative commandments, you shall not murder. He focuses on the negative as well. What a peace we often forfeit. What needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Again, he's talking about that balm of prayer, the ability to have some healing in our lives, even if the answer isn't coming yet, by knowing that there is one there who's listening, who has our best interests in heart. Listen also as God sings, God sends, sings the song Blessings by Laura Story, uh, amazing chorus about how blessings may come through raindrops or tears, not just the things that we want to have happen. I find in concluding that if your prayer isn't quote unquote working, or if you need that answer and you're not hearing the clear affirmative answer from God, what I know has personally worked in my life when facing an important decision is to lay out my choices for God and saying, okay, God, here's the decision I've made. If it's not the one you want me to make, dissuade me. Don't just pray for affirmation and, and a granting of peace or power. 
but sometimes that conflict. I know there was a law firm I worked for for a long time and I kept praying for advancement there and they weren't advancing anybody ahead of me but I wasn't advancing and I was very frustrated and I kept praying that things would change there when God's actual plan was for me to leave and go out on my own and do other things, get back down to Orange County, but be here for the birth of my children instead of working in Los Angeles. And it wasn't until I prayed that prayer, okay, God, if this isn't where I'm meant to be, show me. And boy, did he show me. I got all kinds of work shoveled on me on Christmas Eve and told I couldn't take a vacation and all these other things that I needed as that kick in the pants to say I'm in the wrong place and I got to move. And that was God's negative cattle prod of prayer, if you will, making sure that I got moving when I needed to. When all else fails... Romans 8.26 tells us that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will help us in our weakness. If you don't know what to pray for, just make a sound. And the Spirit, when we don't know what we ought to pray for, himself will intervene with groans too deep for words. Whatever your prayer, I beseech you to follow Christ's example in a garden. Ask for specific relief, and above all else, not your will, not my will, but yours. Amen.